no problem. We're just letting letting participants sign on. Um, okay. Uh, hello. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Jen Cool, and I'm the Policy and Campaigns Lead with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, which is a member-based national organization that works on research and advocacy at the intersection of human health and planetary health. Um, I'm currently living and working on the traditional indigenous territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, which is an agreement that in my understanding is premised on the idea of um, never taking more than you need um, in that we're all sharing, we're all sharing from the same dish and we're sharing with a single spoon. Um, and um, I think that that's, it's very evident that that's not um, a, a part of the treaty that settlers have upheld. Um, and so part of the reason that I think it's important to, that we are acknowledging territory um, or at the beginning of um, this work is to keep, keep present in our minds that um, all of the work that we do is occurring on um, it, indigenous land um, and that we have a, a responsibility to work in a way um, that brings us closer to equity and addresses the injustices that have occurred since settlers arrived here. Um, I'm, and in many ways, this webinar um, is, is addressing, really addressing the topic of how we relate to the land. Um, so I'm excited to, to introduce our guests to you today. So joining us, um, we have four, um, four doctors, all of whom are based in BC. Dr. Melissa Lem is a CAPE board member and a Vancouver family physician who also works in rural and Northern Canada. She's a frequent media commentator, journalist, and writer, and has been involved in advocacy work on a broad range of topics, including fracking, climate change, wildfires, and the Nature Health Connection. We also have Dr. Larry Barzlai, who's a family doctor in Vancouver and the head of CAPE's BC chapter. We're joined by Warren Bell, who's a past founding president of CAPE, a family, a family physician for 44 years, and has been involved in environmental, social, peace, and health-related advocacy for nearly four decades. And Dr. Ulrike Meyer, who's a family physician practicing in Dawson's Creek since 1992. Um, she raised her three children in Dawson's Creek and loves peace country. She immigrated there from, she immigrated from Germany in 1989 and first um, went to Northeast BC in 1985 as her husband owns a farm there. Um, and we're also on the call joined by CAPE's uh, Executive Director and CEO, Robin Edger. So I'll turn it over to Melissa for the content of the webinar. All right, thanks, Jen, for the introduction. So to be completely honest, until about, you know, three years ago, I didn't really know what was happening with fracking in Northeast BC. I mean, the main focus of my environmental work over the past decade has been around connecting people to nature. But it's become so clear to me through my work with CAPE and BC in particular that fracking and climate change are threatening people's ability to connect to the beautiful nature we have here in BC and benefit from a healthy environment. So I'm going to start off by sharing my screen here. Um, let's see. It looks like I don't have the, the ability to share my act, like my full screen. Is that right? Or um... you should be able to share. Did it change now? Okay, hold on one second. There we go. Um, that's actually whiteboard. Sorry, never mind. Oh. Um, Okay, I wanted to. I wanted it to be full screen, but um, if you, yeah, is it okay? Here we go. Is it working now? Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that slide? Actually, all we, right now, what we can see is a zoom. Is zoom. So if you if you go back now that your PowerPoint is open, if you go back to if you stop sharing your screen and start again, you might get the opportunity to share your 
PowerPoint? Okay. Um, I don't think so. I think I might have to share it right from my PowerPoint because I'm not getting the option to share my full screen. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, did, did that work? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry. All right. Okay. So to start off, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what exactly fracking is. So to create a fracking well, um, you drill a shaft down four, four kilometers into rock and then several more horizontally for up to three kilometers in a process called directional drilling. And then you inject um, millions of liters of water, sand and chemicals under high pressure into the rock, cracking it to release gas deposits. So some of this fracking wastewater stays underground and some of it often containing heavy metals, carcinogenic compounds and radioactivity comes back up to the surface where it's stored in open frac ponds like tailings, ponds from mining. And at multiple stages of this process, um, whether it's through flaring, gas leaks or fracking fluid leaks, fracking pollutes the water, land and air with chemicals that are known to harm human health. And I should also mention that because it's expensive to treat, some of this um, fracking wastewater is inject injected back into the ground permanently to store in deep injection wells. And what's even worse is that when fracking is done, lots of companies leave behind abandoned and orphaned wells and untreated frac ponds, which in many cases, no one is monitoring and no one is paying cleanup costs for, which makes the risks of leaks and pollution even higher. So Canada is the fourth largest producer of natural gas in the world, but today in BC, over 85% of that gas is produced through fracking or unconventional fracked gas. So as you can see, there's nothing natural about liquefied natural gas in Canada because most of it comes from fracking. And so this is a slide of the of wells in the Montney Formation. So since 1985, so this is in Northeast BC in the Peace Region. Um, in, since 1985, about 20,000 wells have been drilled in BC. And you may have heard about that uh, $40 billion LNG Canada project, which is uh, involves an export terminal and a plant in Kitimat, and then the coastal gas link pipeline that's going to run gas from the fracking fields in the Peace to the coast. And so this is the largest private sector investment in fossil in the fossil fuel industry in Canadian history. And because of it, we could see up to 50,000 fracking wells being drilled in Northeast BC alone. Um, so I'm done with this part of my slide show. I'm going to stop it. And then I think I'm going to turn it over to Larry. Thanks, Melissa. Everybody can see that? Yep. Um, okay. Um, the um, Cape uh, BC established himself three or four years ago, and we tried to decide what are our priorities. BC is such a beautiful natural environment. Uh, it, it's tough to know what you should focus on as an environmentalist. Uh, so many people have so many different ideas. Is, is, is it fish farming or pesticides or dealing with some of the, the big animals that we have that people come from all over the world to see or our forests? Or uh, do we look forward to the day when something like the Exxon Valdez might happen and sully our coast? Um, all, all these things are in the back of our minds. So we thought that fracking was the biggest uh, area that we should concentrate on. And I'll, I'll try to explain why. Um, this is a, a graph of, of BC's uh, carbon um, output. Um, now, as you can see, uh, around 2020, we put out about 62 megatons of carbon dioxide uh, emissions per year. And as you can see, we're way above uh, our 2020 target that, that the BC government had, had uh, opted for many years ago. And we don't even talk about that anymore. Now, as you can see from um, our next goal is 2030, that we need to be limit our output dramatically um, by uh, 2030. And as you can see by the two upper lines in the direction we're going, we're not uh, getting there by a long shot. Um, and Canada is equally uh, culprit. Um, you can see that uh, the the lines for Canada's admissions are pretty straight also. Um, and the, while we have knowledge of what's going on, we're, we're not doing much about it. And we need to to um, uh, do a lot more as a, as a province and a country to uh, change these graphs. Um, now, why is fracking so important? Uh, we want to give you an example of LNG Canada that Melissa uh, mentioned and the coastal gas link which supplies the pipeline. Um, and this is one of several companies that have submitted proposals. So um, whatever is happening to LNG Canada could be multiplied. 
Um, so as Melissa said, uh, the the um, the fracked gas will come from north or eastern BC, uh, be transferred by pipeline to the liquefaction plant in Kitimat on the coast, and from there uh, to tankers uh, in the Far East. Um, Pembina, a quite reputable organization, has calculated that uh, at its peak, LNG Canada will produce nine megatons per year of CO2 emissions. Now keep in mind that we're sitting at around 62 and we've got to go down to 46 by the year uh, 2030. And this is going to increase another nine megatons. So we're going in absolutely the wrong direction with, uh, with this process. Um, equally interesting, it's a bit of a bit of an involved map, but look at the, the left hand circle. Uh, one thing we don't talk about is the amount of emissions that we're exporting to the countries in the Far East that will be receiving our natural gas. Uh, this calculated, they will, um, from uh, LNG Canada and one other company, they're, they're assuming the two companies are involved, that they will be burning 62 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions themselves. So do we not bear some responsibility in BC for contributing to that also? Um, I just read this, the World Economic Forum has an energy transition index that compares various countries and how well they're doing and getting away from fossil fuels and going to renewables. And we have the distinct pleasure of being last. We're tied with the United States, uh, Brazil, and Iran for being in the last place in terms of our development. So we, we as a country have a long way to go. How are other countries doing? Um, the United States, uh, believe it or not, is doing better than we are. Uh, there, you can see their, their, their emissions are decreasing, not dramatically, but they're going at least in the right direction. Um, and despite all the negative things we, we, we think uh, about the United States, there's, pro there's uh, states like California that have done a dramatic job to decrease their emissions, and this uh, is reflected in uh, the American total. Uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom has done an amazing job starting 30 years ago. You can see how dramatically they, they've cut their, their greenhouse gas emissions almost in half. Um, and the European community, similarly, uh, they've even exceeded their climate targets, as you can see under the, just look up from the year 2020, you can see the goal was minus 20% and they've already surpassed that. Uh, so there are other countries that are doing a much better job than we are and can set a good example for us. Um, now, why is so little attention being paid to what is happening up north? That was one of the things that we've been uh, thinking about for a long time. Um, uh, Kinder Morgan has been quite popular here. There's been several rallies, uh, tens of thousands of people have participated, but we don't see in the same level of rallies protesting uh, LNG development in the, in the Northeast. And, and there, there are several reasons for that. Um, similar to Melissa's slide, uh, the area in Northeastern BC um, is far away. It's east of the Rockies. It almost seems like it's geographically part of Alberta. Um, and um, it has a small population. And much of the population there um, is involved in the fracking industry, so it's hard to generate a lot of objection. And people from down here are not aware of what goes on because it's so far away. So Warren Bell and I decided to do something about this. We did a tour of northern BC um, and, and about a year and a half ago, starting off uh, in the fracking areas and gradually going through the province to, uh, to the site of the liquefaction plant along the coast. Um, here are some pictures that I took uh, along our way. The, one can see how intrusive the fracking industry is into the farming areas, um, building their pipelines between farmlands and they can go underneath the, the, uh, the farms uh, without the farmer's permission. And the, the vast amount of water that's involved, this is one of the holding tanks uh, that collects water for fracking. Um, uh, old Ricky uh, Meyer in Dawson Creek was gracious enough to arrange a meeting for us with, uh, with doctors uh, in that area so we had a better idea of uh, what goes on there. Uh, there are positive things. This is the municipal solar array in Hudson Soap, which is uh, one of the best in the country. So there are some positive things happening too. Now, um, Orton and I gave a talk on October 6th. Uh, I guess a, a date that shall uh, lie in infamy, uh, that we, we give a talk to about 30 people about the, the harms of fracking. The other side of the city, Premier Horgan is announcing his $40 billion LNG project. Um, so you can guess who had a bigger attendance and they gave out free hot dogs, which I, I assume attracted a few more people too. So this is, this is what we're up against. Um, and um, 
and we saw these signs all over the place. It's it's big, big business up there. People support the, the fracking industry. Um, and we followed this up uh, with a tour of, of the south. Uh, uh, we decided we'll bring some of the people from the north and some of the ideas down south. We arranged for a five city tour of the lower mainland about a year ago. Um, we, we were especially proud to have brought down some of the uh, Wet'suwet'en elders, Amali Wickham on the left and Chief Smogogum on the right, who addressed uh, crowds in, in, in various five cities to educate people down here what is really happening up north. We brought some farmers down uh, to, who could demonstrate personally uh, what is happening to their, to their land because of the fracking industry. And just wanted to conclude um, with, with COVID-19, and we have such a great opportunity to make a difference, um, but, but are, we, are we reeling when we see what's going on uh, with the oil and gas industry? Uh, I, I'm not sure we are making the difference that we should be. Like Trans Mountain Pipeline, the uh, like Kinder Morgan Pipeline is, is under construction. The liquefaction plant in Kitimat is under, under full instruction. Um, uh, industry is proceeding despite large numbers of COVID-19 positive workers. Uh, this is from a uh, town in, uh, in northern Alberta. Um, so life, life is going on despite what reservations we have. And this I was particularly impressed with is a list of the uh, work sites uh, that the pipeline company is developing. And I don't know if you can read some of the fine numbers there, but over the next two years, they're going to be building the, the sites and the pipeline and have definite um, uh, plans uh, for how this whole pipeline it is, is going to proceed. So, so things are, are really happening, uh, not necessarily in a positive way up north. So in conclusion, um, Canada is not doing a good job in terms of other countries, in terms of what we, we should be doing. LNG development is proceeding full force. Um, and we're, we're, we are far, far from being able to make our climate targets and fracking is one of the biggest reasons for that. So thank you and I'll pass it on to uh, my colleagues who will give more fine detail as to what is happening up north. All right, Warren, I think you're up. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I live in a different uh, Indigenous area, the um, unceded territory of the Shukwepmik people who are part of Interior Salish uh, sort of larger community. Um, this is land that has never been ceded and uh, BC is a hotbed of controversy about um, the impact of settler uh, presence on the land. And so I think we have, um, we have a lot to be responsible for. So here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about environmental impacts of fracking in more, more detail. And the subtext of what I'm going to say is that this is what we're dealing with. Um, politics have meddled in a process that um, has led to ignoring the harms, the environmental harms of fracking in a fairly formal and continuous and unbroken way. So here's our former uh, Premier, Christy Clark, uh, extolling the virtues of natural gas. Uh, Warren, uh, yes. we can't see your screen, it seems like. Oh my goodness, I can see my screen, which is... Um, let me just try that again. Visible? Uh, no. Well, it looks perfect. Let me let me just hit share screen again. Are you seeing my screen? No, I it's promise. <laughs> if you're if you're folks are listening, we tried this before and we did it. it worked perfectly it well. It worked so well. Yes. So. Um, I see Larry's stuff. I wonder if that's. Okay. Got something to do you with should, it. You should, you should, yeah, that could be something to do with it. Um, Nothing yet. I have this perfect vision of my slides, which is uh, wonderful for me, but no good for anybody else. Okay, it looks. Larry, could you make sure that you're not sharing the screen? I can still see your slides. On oh, Larry, screen. yeah, okay. Let's try now. Anything showing up? No. 
Dear me. This worked so well before. Yeah, it really did. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, do you, do you, can you um, quickly email me your slides and then we can see if I can share them? Gosh. I, um, sure. <laughs> um, you know, I'll have to get out of this. Does someone else want to, um, Why like, somebody else uh, go ahead Ulrika, do you want that? Yeah. health impacts um, while we figure this out? Ulrike, do you want to go ahead while we're just working on Warren's slides? Okay, sure. Thanks. Um, I'm working here in Dawson Creek for a long time, came over from Germany in 85. And back then, fracking was like you saw the single pump jacks for oil and single gas wells, but not fracking done until 2004. And so the first fracking wells were single wells, and now they are multi-well pads. They can be from 8, 16, 32, and they assured us they can go up to 40 to 60 wells per pet. And in the northeast of BC, we have around 90,000 people living and serving. And uh, compressor station, gas plants, holding ponds for the toxic wastewater, they take now up to 25% of the agricultural land reserve. Unfortunately, the agricultural land, land reserve is now also controlled by the Oil and Gas Commission. And so unconventional natural gas development is close to residential areas, farmers, schools, waterways, and roads. And so they have exposure 24-7. For instance, out here in Farmington is a small rural area, and which is overdeveloped, and Larry and um, Warren could see firsthand. There is Parkland Elementary School, and uh, behind the school is a multi-well pad. So in case of an emergency that they have a blowout and uh, high H2S levels, the teacher has to decide uh, either to get the kids safely to the bus, which is front, parked in front of the door, or if that is not safe, to take them out and they keel over, they have to shut off the furnace and each classroom has a box of duct tape and they will duct tape the doors and windows. So that's the emergency plan. And as we know, oil and gas workers have a seven times higher mortality rate than other industrial workers, and that's due to the exposure to chemicals. Uh, recently, we had one case of a 26-year-old young man with stage 4 esophageal cancer with METS. Uh, he's married and has a 17-month-old son. He's a non-smoker and worked his adult life as, um, oil and, in the oil and gas industry. It's amazing that in his short lifespan and being exposed to have that kind of cancer uh, so far gone, which is really sad. Um, I also got involved in more detail when where I live outside Dawson Creek on a ridge and they supposed to build a multi-well pad to us in the summer of 2018 and you get a consultation note and you can write a letter within 28, uh, 21 days. And I looked at all the studies coming out of the states and was flabbergasted how much evidence there is that unconventional natural gas uh, extraction is so harmful to human health and to the environment. My good friend Karen Levin, who's an environmental consultant, mainly working for the mining industry, was flabbergasted too because the regulations are so poor. We sent our letters, but uh, we thought we had it pocketed and we could stop that project, but no way. There is no regulation, really. There is no environmental impact study. There's no baseline study needed. And so they're exempted from many things, but the mining industry is not exempted, where we learned from 100 years of history of mining and the negative side effects. Locally, here in the medical community in Dawson Creek, we had some health flag raised, uh, one by our radiologist who told us in the summer of 2018 that he diagnosed his tenth case of uh, glioblastoma. He worked many years in South Africa and didn't have that kind of rate in a bigger population he served. Glioblastoma is... Um, malignant form of brain cancer, one of the worst ones you can have. It's incurable. Most people will go undergo surgery, radiation therapy, and chemo, and the median survival is around 15 months. 
uh, more common in men than women and peak incidences between the ages of 45 to 75, although we have cases with age 32, 28, way younger than you would expect. Um, a risk factor for glioblastoma is exposure to radiation, and um, that can be ionizing radiation or natural occurring radioactive material called NORM, which get brought back up uh, with wastewater during the fracking process. The second health concern was expressed by our internist, Dr. Suk Sakaria. He practiced for two years in Dawson Creek and left us last year, February. And he said he had 10 cases of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, idiopathic means there's no known reason for uh, the pulmonary fibrosis happening. He ruled out uh, systemic lupus or other causes that they had no exposure to asbestos. And um, the scarring of the lungs is happening anatomically and symptomatically. There is exertional dyspnea and an irre irreversible loss of pulmonary function. The median survival is two to five years. And uh, the current treatments option do not improve life quality or survival. And uh, the incidence increased overall. Uh, and the UK had the best numbers, which was 4.6 per 100,000 population as an incidence. So if I extrapolate that for the South Peace, where we serve around 35, 30 to 35,000 people, we would expect 1.5 cases per 30,000 and not 10 cases. Overall, there is a rising incidence particularly in highly industrialized regions, and autopsy studies of people who died of um, pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic one, had increased levels of silicone and aluminum in the hyalur lymph nodes, which are close to the lungs, and patients without the diagnosis had nothing in the hyalur lymph nodes. And so silica is the main ingredient of the frac sand, and aluminum levels are elevated in the ground and drinking water of the South Peas. Um, the third flag was earlier raised by our internist, Dr. Mark Lambiot, who moved his family down south to the island due to environmental reason, and he stated that he saw some endothelial lymphosarcoma, uh, but in really rare locations like the sinuses, and he said normally he would expect one in 500,000, and he saw three in his time practicing in Dawson Creek. The other good... Uh, Development was Dr. Elise caron Baudois. She came as a PhD student to Dawson Creek in 2016 and had some funding to do um, biometric data in 30 pregnant women. And it happened that she had uh, 15 pregnant patients here in Dawson Creek and 15 in Chetwind, which is probably uh, 80 clicks from uh, south of Dawson Creek. So she um, did a pilot study and collected from these uh, pregnant women hair samples, urine samples, and also their water, which they were drinking in each household. And uh, when she looked at the hair samples, there were increased levels of aluminum, barium, strontium, and manganese. And all these are naturally occurring in the Montney Formation, which is four or five kilometers below us. And um, barium is especially interesting because it's rock bound so it should be not really elevated it's bound in rock and so industrial activity may release these trace metals from deeper rock formation and then is found in the groundwater her urine results she took five spot urines from these women they showed increased benzene metabolites and they're known hormone re disruptors and also carcinogenic and so high exposure to benzene during pregnancy is associated with low birth weight and high risk of childhood leukemia and a greater incidence of birth defects like for the heart, etc. And like two months ago, we had a newborn male with abnormal facial features. He was missing a jawbone and his ear on one side of the face and had a heart defect. It was not my own patient and he was shipped out to Vancouver. Elise also developed a system where she looked at a birth outcome study, and she looked at 6,000 births from the Fort St. John Hospital, which is 80 kilometers west of us, northwest, and she looked at low birth weight and premature labor, premature labor being less than 37 weeks gestation. 
she looked at the postal code of these pregnant uh, these birth uh, birthing mums and put a 10 kilometer radius around them and then um, combined it with the oil and gas commission maps for all their industrial structure, um, structures like wells plants compressor station and um, it was under review in her scientific journals and the results are I think due to be published now and um, then Elise came back in 2019, was funded for 100 pregnant women, and she actually collected 90 pregnant women who were willing to participate in her study. And this time she collected air and water samples from each household and then hair, urine, and nail samples from each woman. And um, these will be released later. I think this biometric data is probably our best um, bet to prove anything that there is harm to the population in this area. And there's not many biometric um, studies underway, so we're really fortunate that Elise came to our area. And epidemiology studies are, because it's a smaller population, the total probably for the Northeast being 90,000, that they say that hasn't have enough weight. Nevertheless, after the Cape tour down south, uh, we did um, form a research team, which I'm really grateful for. And initially, we received a grant for 5,000 to bring together academic and community-based researchers from a number of disciplines who are currently engaged in research on fracking and human health. And that team meeting happened in September 2019 here in Dawson Creek. And we had the opportunity to arrange for flights over this area and see what impact the industrialization of this uh, farmland and beautiful country uh, has. Then we received funding from the Rural Coordination Center of BC for $10,000, and the project was titled The Human Health Effects of Exposure to UNGD and uh, a Systematic Review, which is being carried out at the moment. And then we were able to get the Lloyd-Jones Collins Foundation grant from UBC for $30,000. And uh, this research project will look at uh, if there's an association between exposure to hydraulic fracturing and exacerbation of asthma in northeastern British Columbia. And the ethics approval just went through. And with asthma, we had have a high incidence here. And in Pennsylvania, they did studies and showed that there's a quadrupling of asthma exacerbation when actually the fracking sites are in production. So you don't see much on the surface when they produce um, the uh, natural gas, but then they saw the exacerbation of asthma. So I'm glad that we could do some research project in the North East, which is really important. And currently, I ask for some funding from our division here to look at the anonymous survey to other healthcare providers in the North East of BC to see if they share our concerns we have for the health of the public here we serve. And uh, I hope that can be done this summer. It's just for open-ended question. It came as a side thought and developed as more work than I expected. <laughs> but I think it will give us some answers to if in other communities uh, in the Northeast there is concerns. Thanks, Ulrike. That is um, harrowing and, and such incredible to get those um, individual health impacts on people. Um, Let's give Warren another try. Give him a try. <laughs> give him a try. <laughs> All right. Is it showing up this time? It is, yeah. Yeah, I discovered I was following the wrong path. Okay. I'm on the right path. You are. Um, <laughs> so um, after Ulrike's uh, brilliant expose of, of the reason why Larry and I went up north, which was to make contact with people living with the impacts of fracking. Um, you can see the fruit that it's born and that Ulrike has and, and Karen with her have moved ahead to do some really, really critical research uh, with, of course, Elise Carol Baudouin being a, a prime participant. I'm going to talk about things that are kind of connected to everything that's been said so far, but looking at sort of the, the broader picture to some degree as well. So I've subtitled this um, Politically Motivated Willful Ignorance. And the reason for that is that um, well, you'll see what I have to say. First of all, here's our former premier extolling the virtues of natural gas. 
Here's our current premier doing exactly the same thing, despite the fact that he was diametrically opposed, apparently, in terms of his overall uh, approach while he was in opposition. Now, just in case anybody listening isn't aware, LNG and natural uh, and fracking are essentially the same thing. Melissa pointed that out. Um, more than 85% of um, uh, liquid natural gas is derived directly from fracked gas. So here's a typical scenario regarding how we look and at and discover uh, environmental harms from fracking. So this is a study that uh, found uh, a very unusual birth defect, dysphagia, uh, in newborn horses, foals. Uh, but the important thing is, look at the date here. This, is, this was published uh, barely 10 days ago. And uh, as a result, it's typical of what's happened when we look at environmental effects and human health effects. Uh, this is the study itself, and the key thing here is that the adverse effects occurred before the, the harm was removed, and then the harm was removed, and they went away. So it's a very clear-cut study, small scale, and it took 21 months for this to happen. This was a slow study uh, that occurred years after what's been going, going on, because what's been going on is that the fracking industry has not put a shovel down uh, or stopped um, its production activity, extraction activity, for for more than 20 or, th or 20 years. And as a result, we in the science and professional community have been following after the massive uh, uptick in fracking. And of course, we're playing catch up, moving at, relatively speaking, compared to the industry, a snail's pace. Now, the BC government actually commissioned a study, um, as you can see, it's about a year and a half ago, and uh, was looking at hydraulic fracturing, and they had two questions to answer. There was a three-person commission. First of all, do the regulations actually manage risks associated with fracking for humans and uh, the environment? And the second thing is, could we improve the framework, the, the regulatory framework to make it better? Well, this is what they actually found. Now, on, this is from the executive summary. Every yellow patch says the same thing. We don't have enough information. We need more research. I'll just read the one in the middle, the little skinny one. It says, it was the experience of the panel that many of the expert presentations identifying key knowledge gaps emphasize the need for further research. And the other two larger yellow areas say exactly the same thing in more detail. In other words, we don't know what we're doing to the environment. We don't know what we're doing to human health, but that is no impediment to proceeding um, gung-ho with the uh, expansion of the extraction industry. So what do we actually know? Now it's been touched on by uh, both Larry and Melissa and Ulrike in particular with regards to human health, but let's just briefly list them. Air and water contamination, animal problems, noise, which has had an, an important effect on animals as well, massive water use, invasive infrastructure, earthquakes, and radiation, so radioactivity. So I'll just go through each one. I'm not going to be exhaustive. Time doesn't permit that. Now, this is an interesting picture of Jessica Ernst, who's in Alberta, but she is lighting her drinking water on fire. And we've seen pictures of that from the States, and it's dramatic, and people would say it's not very scientific, but when you are drinking water that you can do this to, um, you can tell that there's something wrong. There's only one study ever been done, a uh, scientific study uh, spreading the produced water, the water that comes back out of fracked, <clears throat> fracking operations onto the land. And it was done in Virginia and it was done nine years ago and nobody's ever talked about it or done it since because this is what happened. It basically destroyed the forest. So the material that comes out of uh, fracking wells is actually highly toxic and when it's deliberately put on the land to see what happens, this is what happens. It's horrifying. Um, now, wildlife effects I've uh, mentioned earlier, the, the effect on horses, but in many parts of the heavily fracked areas, there are no uh, large-scale wildlife. We talked to farmers in um, the Farmington area and they said, one of the farmers was a regular hunter, he said, you can't hunt here anymore because there's no animals. Um, noise. Uh, there's not a lot of work on noise, but noise has profoundly disturbing effects on the ecosystem. And I'll just read what's in that red square. Um, 
Phylogeny contributes only a little of the variation in response to noise. That means it doesn't matter which animal you're talking about, they all are affected. Thus, the effects of anthropogenic noise, noise produced by humans, can be explained by the majority of species responding to noise rather than a few species being particularly sensitive to noise. Therefore, this man-made noise must be considered as a serious form of environmental change and pollution as it affects both uh, waterborne, uh, aquatic, and terrestrial species. In other words, it has a huge disruptive effect on the ecosystem, uh, as well as, of course, disrupting the lives of human beings. The amount of water that's used, that's my fourth point, um, a lot. Uh, in some wells in Texas, up to 10 million gallons per uh, fracking operation. And this is a typical scene in northeastern BC. These are trucks, and I have patients who have driven these water trucks. And it's a 14-hour it's a shift seven days a week when you work in that industry because the amount of water consumed is absolutely colossal. Infrastructure, construction number five, the point I was making. Well, this is a typical wellhead, and all these, I don't know if you could see my cursor running around here. These, these are the machines that produce the pressure, the frack pumps as, is what they're called. And they all line up together and they take sand from here, the sand and sand storage tanks, and the water from here, which has been mixed up here with these blenders some chemical trucks, and they fire it down this, <clears throat> this hole here, the wellhead, at enormous pressure. It's literally an explosion. It's called uh, you know, um, a stimulant, stimulation of the well. But if you were stimulated that way, you'd probably be sitting on the uh, surface of Mars uh, at this present time. It's incredibly powerful, shakes the ground, and produces uh, all sorts of other effects. This is Farmington that um, is the area that we first visited when Larry and I went north uh, to see what was going on in northern BC. These red circles are all the um, wellheads and other processing areas that were that were all over the countryside when we were there and you can see as Larry showed in his slide from the ground level that there are their surrounding farming established uh, areas. Um, earthquakes, the sixth point I was making, obviously they vary but this is the worst one that has occurred it was in Oklahoma um, nine years ago and the freestanding chimney that this guy had built in his farm came down through the roof when the, the 5.7 uh, on the Richter scale uh, magnitude earthquake struck. Um, and his wife used to sit exactly where all the bricks from the, the um, uh, uh, fire uh, chimney fell. But in BC, we've, we're, we're doing very well. We've produced um, literally thousands of earthquakes, um, 40 plus over three, uh, three's magnitude and um, three greater than four, which have rattled uh, buildings in Fort St. John and other local areas uh, considerably. Finally, radiation coming from underground. Um, this particular article, if you ever want to read a, an extensive uh, journalistic ex expose of what's going on here, um, the amount of radiation it produces is actually greater than acceptable for, uh, for the working environment. And a lot of this water um, does get uh, distributed outside the collecting tanks and the um, settling ponds that have been set up to contain it. And so radiation is a sort of an unspoken element. And all of the calculations about how much radioactivity there is are done by industry and are kept as um, commercial secrecy information. So outside the industry, people rarely hear about it. So I guess the final point I want to leave you with is that, um, and this, and this sounds like a bit of a tautology, but it isn't really. Lack of evidence of harm, lack of evidence of harm is not the same as evidence of lack of harm. In other words, the fact that the research hasn't been done to show that there is harm is not proof that there isn't harm. The evidence is scanty, it's slow to catch up to the rampant uh, forward movement of the fracking industry. But as we do more research, <clears throat> what we find is more and more evidence of harm. So we're, we're really playing uh, a fool's game. We're trying to catch up to an industry that is um, madly proceeding <clears throat> and its harms are only being uh, 
partially assessed as we go along while the people who want this industry to move ahead, which are mostly in the political realm, uh, just turn away from this evidence um, pretty much across the board. So that's my uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Warren. And we'll pass it back to Melissa for some stories from the front lines. Share my screen. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So, I mean, we've just heard from Ulrika and Warren and Larry about how devastating fracking is for climate change and environmental and human health. But to a lot of us, these words and these numbers don't really feel real until we can put faces to them. So for over a year, I've, uh, as a doctor and a journalist, I've been interviewing people who live in Northern BC and writing about the real impacts this industry has had on their lives. And I'm going to share some of these stories with you. So the first person is Karen Levin, um, who Ulrika mentioned is a friend of hers. So she's an environmental scientist and a mom, and her family moved to Dawson Creek in 2013 to be closer to nature in a small town. And for a few years, life was good. They would have birthday parties in the backyard, and the kids would play on the trampoline, listening to the birds singing. But then fracking started near them in January 2019. And so now they live within three kilometers of 96 sour gas wells, and on the hill above their house where her husband used to hike, there's an open fracking pit and flare stacks. And her house sits at the end of what used to be a little country road that's now filled with constant dangerous traffic from semi-trucks that have almost run them over um, during school bus times. And now when they lie on the trampoline, all they can hear is a droning drilling sound that keeps them awake at night. And when their kids' friends come over, sometimes they get scared um, because they can smell gas leaks, but because they're outside of what's called the emergency response zone, they actually have no one to report it to. So Karen is, um, she's shocked that no baseline water or air quality studies were done before fracking moved in and no one is monitoring the changes in the environment now. And she said to me, quote, I've worked as an environmental consultant on mining projects from Alaska to BC and my mind is blown by this industry. If I did these things in my job, I would be fired on the spot. We had a little piece of heaven and now it's all gas and flare stacks. So the next person I want to talk about um, is Head Chief Smogel Gamma, and he's on the, on the right-hand side of your picture there. And so I want to mention that fracking and LNG development, they don't only affect people who live in Northeast BC. It's also affecting communities and especially Indigenous communities along the pathway of the coastal gas link pipeline to the coast, as we saw with the removal of Wet'suwet'en Nation members from their own traditional lands um, by the RCMP this winter. So we had the privilege of hearing Head Chief Smogel Gem of the Sun House of the Fireweed Clan speak at our fracking speaker series last year, and I'm going to read you some of his words. He said, I used to teach environmental monitoring in Northern BC and Northern Alberta. And I had an opportunity to visit Port Chippewyan right in the middle of the tar sands. I was up there teaching for three months and there were young people in my class that were getting diagnosed with rare cancers. The people there were dying at alarming rates. I had to give the students three separate breaks through those three months to allow them to go back and participate in funerals. That place changed my life. At that time, there were 13 proposed pipelines that wanted to cross over our territories. I worked at the Unistoten camp for eight years. One of my friends lived for 18 years on the downtown east side and I came down to pick him up. He spent an entire winter up in our healing center, completely alcohol and drug free. He learned how to trap, he learned how to eat healthy, he learned how to take care of himself and he's put on a lot of weight. That place is a beacon of hope for people who are trying to stand up for the environment, but it's also a beacon of hope for people who want to get healthy, and they both go hand in hand. In order for us to make any difference in the climate change that's happening, that's kicking down our front door right now, we need to make sure that we have Indigenous people and Indigenous decision makers taking that lead. We are the ones that are taking the biggest risks because we have a solid connection to those territories. Take anywhere in North America, dig down as deep as you can go. You're going to find genetic evidence of the people who have been there for thousands of years because we've been here so long. We're here for the long run. We're not going anywhere. We've survived so many things and we're going to survive this as well and we're going to win. So the next person I want to introduce to you is Carl Matson, um, And what's happened with him really 
illustrates how incredibly damaging fracking can be because of how it tear apart communities and it pits neighbors against neighbors. And this is something I've heard from every person I've interviewed about fracking. So Carl Matson, he describes himself as a farmer and artist and unfortunately sometimes an activist. And he's a fifth generation farmer who lives in Rolla, BC with his 12 year old daughter. And the year she was born, he called the year of the flaring because so much oil and gas activity was happening around his farm. Carl has had sour gas leaks near his house that have made him so afraid that he started building bunkers to keep his family safe if and when a major gas leak happens. And he said that one of the worst parts of fracking is the directional drilling. So if you don't agree to let a company put their infrastructure on your land, they just hop across the road to your neighbor's place, pay them, and then drill down and under your farm and take the resources from your land without paying you. And so what happens is a lot of farmers end up giving up and letting fracking happen because they don't have the time or energy to fight it. And people who do speak up have to be so brave um, because most of their wider community works for the oil and gas industry. So Carl has been approached in his own community by strangers who try to pick fights with him because of how he's spoken out against fracking. And unfortunately, unfortunately because of this, um, multi-generational family farms are being sold off to oil and gas because children see the struggles their parents are going through and they don't want to do the same and they move away. So the question is, you know, what can I do as a healthcare worker? And Jim asked, you know, what, what can we do as concerned Canadians? And so the best thing that we can do right now is to make some noise. So talk to people about fracking and LNG so it won't be out of sight and out of mind. Um, write letters and emails to your MLA or MP or meet with them. And I mean, here in BC, some of the most important things that we can do are to push our politicians to end the billions of dollars in tax breaks and other subsidies that are artificially propping up the fossil fuel industry. We need to push them to phase out fracking and we need to push them to transition workers justly and rapidly to renewable energy jobs. I mean, something that no one has mentioned so far is that fracking is actually banned um, or there's a moratorium placed on it in five other provinces in Canada in six states in the US and several countries across Europe. So the question is why, I mean, with BC, we're so clean and green, like why are we allowing it to happen here? So, I mean, everyone in the North I've interviewed, they recognize that the oil and gas industry creates jobs, but dollar for dollar investments in renewable energy create far more jobs than the fossil fuel industry and they're better for the planet. So last but not least, um, what's some one thing that you can do is supporting organizations that are working for a healthy environment like CAPE. And thank you to everyone who's participating in this webinar today. So CAPE um, BC volunteers had actually planned two art exhibits featuring the art of Carl Matson in BC this spring. And we actually launched our Vancouver, our Vancouver show for a few days before we had to take it down because of the pandemic. Um, so keep an eye out for our relaunch, hopefully in 2021. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, we've got a few questions. Um, first of all, does anyone know if radon was looked at in the health studies that were done, um, particularly by Elise? Um, and we've also got a question about the impacts of light pollution um, on remote communities. I can maybe answer Ulrike here. So um, we are sitting now on a radon hotspot here in uh, northeast BC. I was not aware we were. I know the northwest of BC has high radon levels. And when you look at fracking, this um, natural occurring radioactive material, which is radium, can be transferred then into a radon. And I just got from Elise last fall or last summer a radon meter, which I put in my house in the basement to see um, if it's elevated. But if you look on the radon map for BC, Fort St. John, Dawson Creek area, the northeast is now a hot spot for radon too, which then would probably reflect in uh, lung cancer rates. We will still look at the cancer statistics. And again, a small population we serve here, but uh, we would like to see what the numbers are. And we always had a little bit higher mortality rate and lung cancer and COPD and asthma rate than the rest of the province and the country. But it's a farming industry, which you have lots of exposure to small particles and spraying too. So that would explain some of it. But it would be nice to see it in comparison from 20 years ago to now to see a trend. Um, so yeah, radon. And I rem I asked Elise if she could look up the old maps if she has access for the radon exposure. But uh, that's one of my to-do lists to see what was the comparison from the 80s or 90s in this area of this radon. Um, does anyone have? Thank you so much, Ulrike. Does um, 
anyone know about light pollution impacts? And also, does anyone know off the top of their head which provinces have fracking bans? I know New, New Brunswick and Quebec. Anyone else know the other four? Yukon is on hold. Um, Quebec, also, yeah, Quebec, as you mentioned, Quebec. I'm just, um, I'm referring to, here we go. So New Brunswick, there's a partial moratorium, Newfoundland and Labrador, there's a ban, Nova Scotia, there's a ban, um, PEI, there's also a ban, and in Quebec, there's a partial moratorium. Thanks. Um, light pollution, has, has anyone worked on what that, what impact that has had on communities? Warren, uh, you're on mute. I can just mention the um, the effect on wildlife is very significant. Um, many animal species cannot function uh, when their diurnal patterns are disturbed. In other words, they it's dark at night and it's light in the day. Um, of course, we all know about birds that are are set off course by light pollution, but it occurs to ungulates, large animals, uh, uh, deer, moose, elk, etc. They're all um, they're all disturbed by the presence of light, um, or else drawn towards it, which can be just as much of a problem. But it's very very impactful on uh, animal a broad selection of animal species, just as much as noises. I think and I can make a comment UNB. about that. Though. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ulrich. Yeah, like in farming, they have huge gas plants. If you come even 30 clicks away, you think, oh, that's a big city. It's so light up throughout the night, and there's two huge gas plants. And it could be really, it's uh, such a light pollution, which is also for the people living around, besides the flare stacks, which can be really big too. There was one probably burning for over half a year um, north of us, and I could see it from my property, and that was probably 40 clicks away, but it was huge. And one woman said in her house, she lived closer to it, several kilometers away. She never had to put the lights on. It was lightening up her house, house uh, flare stack. It was huge. Larry, did you want to add something? I just wanted to add to what Ulrike just said, uh, that Warren and I and our tour up north visited the farmers there, that you could see three flare stacks from their, their kitchen in one direction and two from their living room in the other direction, and, and the light is 24-7, is and they, they, they never have a dark uh, moment ever. So that's the, the life of people who live in the fracking areas. And just to... I mean, with the people I've spoken with up in up in the piece, they they do. I mean, they mentioned how light pollution has affected them. I don't think there are any specific studies because it's so well known in the literature that, that you know light at times when we shouldn't be experiencing is is terrible for human physiology. Um, so it's not only light, but it's you know um, flaring that goes off in the middle of the night um, that has been described as a 747 going by your house. Like if you can imagine light noise for people who are used to like, uh, who moved up there for a quiet existence, who have lived on these family farms for years. It's, it's just devastating to them. Yeah, absolutely. One, one interesting part about COVID is that because a lot of the operations have shut down, um, we've had um, images sent to us and, and video recordings of people looking off their front and back porch and saying for the first time in years, it's quiet and they can hear animals and they can see bird activity. Um, it made them realize how devastating the impact of fracking has been on the entire ecosystem around them. Thanks. On that, sadly, uh, we're at the hour, so we're gonna wrap. I've just got a note from Angela um, that Ontario, a reminder that Ontario is expanding gas plants um, <laughs> for electricity generation. Um, and the Ontario Clean Air Alliance is building a campaign to oppose that. Um, mostly right now they're using um, gas from the US, but um, it's feasible that, or it's possible that they might seek to bring in gas from BC. Um, and so CAPE has signed on to oppose that. Um, and there, so I'll just drop a link in the chat if you're, if you're in Ontario and wondering um, what's some of the work that you can do in this province. Um, I will um, thank everybody again for joining us. Robin, did you want to say anything to close us out? No, just uh, thank you for joining all of us. Thank you, uh, Drs. Bell, Dr. Lem, Dr. Uh, Barzilai, um, Ulrike, we, the, what a great, um, yeah, just what a great webinar. Thank you very much. Um, 
we do, you know, we do have to pay the bills. So I should mention that, you know, CAPE um, as a charity, we do seek uh, funding from folks like you to be able to continue to do the work that we do. So if you enjoyed the webinar, please do uh, think about donating. If you didn't enjoy the webinar, think about donating anyway, and perhaps we'll put on an even better one next time. Um, but yeah, th thank you again to all the presenters. Thank you to everyone who uh, participated and for all your questions. Uh, I saw some questions that we weren't able to answer around, you know, what, what is Cape doing about this or that or here or there. Please do feel free to email me directly and we can have those conversations. I'm at uh, Robin, R-O-B-I-N, at cape.ca. Thanks, and thanks, Jen, for uh, all the work that you do. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, all.